My name is Bonnie Perry, and I'm the Episcopal Bishop for the Diocese of Michigan. And my colleague is... I'm Sister Veronica. I am a curate at the Cathedral Church of St. Paul in Detroit. And thank you so much for joining us. This is our fifth week of um, our work, our Bible study, our book study that we've been doing on Jim Wallace's Original Sin. And this week, week five, we're going to be looking at Welcoming the Stranger, Racial Justice, and Fixing Our Broken Immigration System. And how about I'll start us with prayer and we'll go from there. Okay. okay. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And also and with you. you. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh, holy and ever-living God, in the midst of the turmoil of our world, help us to ha find a time to be reflective, to breathe, and to seek your wisdom in healing one of the hurts of our world, which is racism. Gracious God, also, too, in the midst of all that is going on in our world with this pandemic. Be with all of our first responders, be with everyone who is ill. And gracious God, may we, may we always be our very best selves. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our first question around this is, um, how does the debate over immigration and immigration reform resonate for you personally um, compared to the debate over criminal justice reform? Um, I, again, for me, um, my, 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 my dad is first generation in this country, but he's first generation from uh, Canada, or as my grandfather was very clear, Newfoundland. Uh, <laughs> because um, grandpa was always mildly annoyed that Newfoundland became part of Canada. Um, so, so dad is first generation, but because, because he's white, um, that, that wasn't really an issue for him. His family was very poor. He's one of 13 and um, they were very poor. So, but I, I'm not, Perhaps that the immigrant status had something to do with that, or it may have had to do with the, um, the Great Depression. So personally, what I'm struck by is I'm, I stand afar and, and I watch and I see our immigration practices and I abhor what our country is doing right now, how we're separating um, parents and children, how we are denying people the right to apply for asylum in this country. Um, and I'm also in the midst of this pandemic, very, very, very worried about the health care that is not being offered to the children and the adults that are in our detention uh, facilities because they have tried to either come into this country by asking for asylum in legitimate ways or if they have um, violated the law and tried to come in um, across a border without um, without papers or without doing it legally either way I feel like we are re we are meeting this desperate need with a um, un humanitarian unchristian response that's that's what i've been thinking about what about you sister yeah when i look at it i think um for me i think the racial aspect is forefront <laughs> um you know the rhetoric the rhetoric that we've heard out of the white house particularly i guess it was maybe a year or so ago when um our president called these people from crap hole countries to clean right. up the language a little bit um, the fact that he really wanted white immigrants. Why not people from Norway? <laughs> you know? That's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Why, why would we welcome all of these black and brown people, especially these black and brown poor people? Yeah. 
And, um, you know, at some point, I can't remember who it was, wanted to rewrite the poem on the Statue of Liberty and say, well, we only want people who can support themselves. <laughs> you know, and that's a pretty direct contradiction to what, you know, not just the biblical prophets said, but what Jesus said. You know, how are, how are we welcoming the poor and the stranger? Yeah. When you welcome the poor and the stranger, you're actually welcoming me. Yeah. And, um, Matthew 25, yeah. 35. Yeah. Yeah. And we haven't, um, we haven't been living that out in our political life very well. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been responding really in fear and, and with the entrenched prejudices that we have in the States. Yeah. What, what do you think? Um, I mean, it's so clear that it is about, it, it is about race. Um, and what, what do you think are some of the concrete ways, um, particularly in faith communities, that we can, we can respond to that? Yeah, I think it's, one is that just the pastoral outreach and the affirmation that these are whole human beings and children of God, but also turning toward ourselves and saying, Jesus actually gave us a pretty clear mandate about this and if we're living into our, our baptismal call, this is something that we, we are obligated to do. We are obligated to welcome the stranger. We can't pick and choose. Um, you know, that's the, the whole point of the, <laughs> the Good Samaritan story is, yeah, these people are your neighbors. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I remember um, after that comment about people coming from undesirable countries, um, we had a, a service of prayer and music just to affirm, you know, all the biblical scriptures that we had that say, we're supposed to welcome you and to embrace you. And um, the people who came to that service were, there were a few people I'd never seen before. Mm. Don't know how they heard about it, but they were, they just thanked us afterward for saying, I'm glad to hear the church is, is actually saying this. And, you know, I think that's one of the things we really need to do is say, this is, this is what Jesus of Nazareth tells us to do. And if we're going to call ourselves his followers, we have to do it ourselves. Um, and I wonder if in the midst of our various faith communities, we, um, in, in the state of Michigan, there are 14 congressional districts. The Diocese of Michigan has congregations in seven of those districts. And, and I, I wonder if there are ways that we as people of faith can be in conversation with our um, elected officials, with our, our Congress people, with our, our senators. And, and I wonder, and our state reps too. Um, and I wonder about um, holding forums and inviting uh, congressional reps to come and speak to us. I mean, we're really interested in this topic and this topic and, and, and maybe, maybe to hear what they have to say about um, uh, racism and, and white privilege and, and immigration. And I mean, and it's one of those things where my experience is, is that I was able to have congressional leaders come to my uh, community um, mostly because they knew I could put 100 people in the room who always voted. Um, and that politicians, as, though, as well they should be, are very interested in being with people who vote. Um, and I just wonder if that might, might be something that we could do um, to be in conversation with the people who are creating the laws for this country. Yeah, you know, kind of playing into their self-interest a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But um, a couple of years ago, the Christian Community Development Association held their annual conference here. And I met someone who was with a movement called Matthew 25. And their congressional representative, you know, he, he liked to play up the fact that he was Christian and he kept these Christian values. And so on immigration, they just started politely sending them these very pointed letters 
with passages of scripture <laughs> in it, highlighting what we're actually supposed to do in welcoming the stranger. And they, and they said, well, you keep saying that you're very Christian and you want to hold up these Christian ideals. Well, here's what the Christian ideals are. <laughs> And eventually they got a response. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and what was it? It was um, political. <laughs> it was a little bit of, you know, covering his butt, I think a little bit. But it was still an acknowledgement that, wow, if I'm going to go on the campaign trail with this, this message of, the, of holding Christian values, maybe I should actually know what those Christian values are. Um, Jim Wallace in his book, he said he, in this chapter, he said, you know, all of a sudden he said, all these people stopped, as he put it, stopped thumping their Bibles and started reading them and realized that Jesus had some pretty pointed things to say about welcoming the stranger that they hadn't been keeping up. So I think just putting out there what we already have in scriptures and maybe just bringing it to the attention of our elected officials who want to cater to you know the faith community yeah and and which brings us to the point too of are we reading those pieces yeah um, are are we spending time with that um one of the one of the things um my previous setting that we did is we had a Sunday morning Bible study, and it was um, the Hebrew prophets and race and, and what they said about inclusion and what they didn't say. And, what, and, and it also it talked about um, immigration as well. And it was a really interesting Bible study. And then they paired it with modern theologians. Um, and, um, and, and people were really struck by it. And the continual question was, and so then what then shall we do? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that's something to, to think about. Um, there, there's a, a question that says, you know, where's your community fallen short? Yeah, yeah. And I, my hunch is um, that many times, um, two things going on here. In a congregation I served that was predominantly white, um, we would dip into these issues and, and then go back and, and dip in Be, because it was almost as if, well, we had the luxury of not having it in our face all the time. Mm -hmm. So someone though, because I was like, oh my God, we keep dipping in and going in and out. And, and, and someone did say to me though, you know, it's a little bit like stretching a muscle, Bonnie. Like, so you have to start, and, you know, and that each time, if you, if, you're, if you keep working it, you are gonna get more flexibility with this. Yeah. Um, but I think the issue is of, ha if, if, it's, if it's a white congregation, sometimes I feel like we have the luxury to maybe not deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And with my congregation, which is extremely diverse and has a large immigrant population from, I think we're covering all the continents right now. But I mean, because we're, we're next to a university, right. we're next to a medical center, you know, we have all of these, we have a lot of immigrants and foreign students. Um, it is in our face. You know, how, how do we welcome someone who's completely different from, you know, what I've known? And it, it gets back to that, it just, these are children of God. We have this commandment and this mandate. How do we love them the way that we would want to be loved? You know, if we came to this new place pretty much by ourselves, what kind of embrace would we want to receive? Right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, very, very much so. And, and I think too, for, for our congregations, sometimes the way we wind up falling short is we get overwhelmed with the enormity of it. 
and the complexity of it. And then, and then you get to interlocking oppressions and people at that point, they're just like banging their head against the table. <laughs> what do I do? Um, and, you know, and there's that deep abiding, like, oh, I'm horrible, you know? Um, and so I think sometimes um, we fall short by not teasing out bits and pieces of it that we can address. And we just look at this monstrous um, issue and, and say, I, I, I can't do that. Yeah. Seeing something huge and just being sort of paralyzed, mm -hmm. you know, but there's that adage, you know, how do you eat an elephant? <laughs> One bite at a time. <laughs> um, but it's, it's making that time and, and that intentionality of saying, okay, we're, we're actually going to deal with this you know, in, in the case of maybe an all-white congregation or a predominantly white congregation, we're going to talk about this for this season or for this month. We're, we're actually going to really think about how can we help our neighbors who are maybe not in this congregation, but especially, I mean, here in this diocese, in our neighborhoods. Right. Yeah. Um, if, going back to the immigration issue, what do you think... I mean, what might comprehensive immigration reform look like? Um, and, and where do you think people, um, communities of faith, you know, what role um, could you imagine in tactics and stuff that we might, we might be involved in with that? If, if you could wave your, um, <laughs> your, your wonderful wand. If I could wave my wonderful wand. Um, I think I would start with, you know, respecting the dignity of every human being. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I would also add an acknowledgement of the long history of the land that we're living on. Mm -hmm. um, oh, well put. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember, you know, when, when they first, well, when people really started looking at the people coming across the southern border, and they assumed that they would need people who could translate from Spanish. But the people coming across were speaking Akateca and Tixtapec and all of these ancient languages of people who have been here long before this country started. Yeah. And I think we need to acknowledge that, you know, we're actually not natives of this, country, of this land and maybe respecting the dignity of people who've been here longer than we are would help us treat them in a more humane and human way. Mm -hmm. So acknowledging exactly where we come from <laughs> yeah. with a little bit of humility, I think, a little humility won't hurt, but to really just to embrace that idea that, yeah, there's, there's a longer history there and how are we treating the people who were here before us? So I think that would be part of my magic wand immigration reform. And, um, you know, understand the reasons why people are fleeing yeah. where they're fleeing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've, um, you know, as, as, a gover as a country, we've supported some policies and regimes in Central America Pretty that are, yeah, that are the root cause or have a huge part to play and why people have to flee a very violent or poor place. Yeah. You know, and um, so I guess a little, <laughs> a, a little self-examination on our part. I would, I would put that as, as a really good foundation for how we're going to approach immigration reform. Yeah, and um, and I guess that self because sometimes that self examination can be well I didn't do it, uh, <laughs> but I think the education, the um, taking some time to read a bit about this and about um, America's role in um, propping up some regimes that maybe for Cold War reasons. Maybe we understood, maybe I understand why we did it, maybe, or I, I have heard the reasoning. <laughs> um, but to understand, given that reasoning, 
these, this is the effect that it wound up having on the daily lives of the people in that country. Yeah. Um, and, and then as a result, it is those people who are now coming here, um, seeking um, sanctuary. And, and, and seeking nothing more than what perhaps you or I want of to be safe um, and to be able to use our gifts that God has given us to, to make a difference in the world and, and to not have our children at risk. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, other thoughts on this? You know, it's such a huge and complex issue. <laughs> and, and like you said, it has all these, what we call now intersectionalities <laughs> with it. Um, but could you say a bit about that? Because not everybody's going to know what interlocking oppression is or intersectionality. <laughs> right, is. yeah. It's, I mean, you have, you know, say a woman from Honduras is coming here to escape you know, the fact with her children because her children are being recruited for gangs. You know, here's this intersection of being a woman, <laughs> which, you know, puts her at risk in many places. Her skin's going to be brown, <laughs> which is another level of risk as she comes to America. A language barrier, you know, these are all interlocking. Poverty. Yep, poverty lack of education, all these interlocking disadvantages. And um, you can't separate them and she's going to face elements of each depending on what situation she's in or elements of all of them at the same time. Yeah. And um, as much as we can't, we can't completely tease apart and do the immigration thing one little bit at, you know, one thread at a time, it's all got to come together somehow it comes together in people's lives as well. And uh, yeah, it's, so when we look at someone, we just want to treat the poverty or we think, well, if she just learns English, she'll be fine. There's actually a lot more going on. <laughs> yeah, but then again, to respond to it, to tease out those bits and pieces we can deal with. Yes. And not let the intersectionality of it overwhelm us so that we do nothing. Right. Um, going, going forward this week, um, there's so much going on in, in our world now with, with COVID. Um, my, my hope, my prayer for all of us is that one, we're safe, um, we're, we're washing our hands, um, we're socially distant, you can see that, um, this time, um, Veronica and I are only next to each other on a screen. Um, but that we can also, um, perhaps, um, do, some, do some reading and do some self-reflection and some educating of ourselves uh, on, on issues of... Um, criminal justice reform, um, on um, immigration reform, and, and, and begin to make a list of when we all get to be with each other again, those activities that you and your faith community might engage in. This is a time for a pause in many ways but that pause can be one where we really begin to do some of the study and reflection that we might not have had time to do if our lives were not now completely upended. Um, that's my hope for us this week. And Sister V, if you'd close us out in prayer. Okay. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious God, you made of one blood all the peoples of the world. You blessed us with many languages and many, many stories. 
give us grace, courage, and help us make the space and the time to share those stories, to learn who one another is, to realize that the entire world is our neighbor and that you have called us to welcome one another because when we welcome one another, we welcome your son and you. Bless us in this time of Lent, a time of self-reflection, a time for study. And may we take the time to listen to your voice and to the voices of those we might not otherwise hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You guys have a great week. Be careful. Be good. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.